innovation. And today you can see the full breadth of the teaching innovation competition. For us, an innovation can be an entire course, it can be an approach to teaching, as you'll hear in a moment, or a specific exercise, activity, assignment, or project. So we have the full spectrum here today of the different things that we consider to be an innovation. So we'll turn it over to uh, David for his presentation. David? So thank you. I'm always glad to be around colleagues that consider teaching to be their A-game as opposed to an afterthought. <laughs> so it's great to meet you all. Maybe we can talk over lunch afterwards. Um, this is both in a, a way of thinking, open intelligence gathering, but it's also a, a series of steps you can implement in the classroom. So, the situation is that we all live in a dynamic interconnected world. Planes get shut down over Ukraine. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities can tank the global financial system. Consumers constantly adopt or abandon tastes. Um, the uh, environment is degrading. Research, resource uh, shortages force firms to adopt more responsible business models. All of this stuff is happening all the time dynamically. And so the modern marketer is challenged with uh, a need to sense emerging developments early, sensing trends early, and also adapting marketing strategy continually uh, to avoid making costly mistakes. So the question in my mind has been, how do I encourage students to take this stuff seriously? You know, what, what are some ways in which we can make what we would call external analysis real? And if you've, if you've taught this, and most of you have, there's a chapter, you know, usually chapter four on external analysis, and it features a uh, hexagon of um, uh, buckets that students should be worried about when they're thinking about the external environment. And, and some of this can be a little abstract. And so my challenge in teaching external analysis has been, um, you know, by the time a textbook gets published, a lot of the example the author uses already outdated. You know, they usually talk about demographic shifts in Hispanic marketing, gender, social media, healthy living. Uh, but these things have been in the water you know, for a long time. So how do we update this stuff in a way that's dynamic, interesting, and manageable? Um, you may have assigned a current events activity in your classes before. So maybe Joe or Jane bring in the current events script from the headlines, and you may discuss it in your marketing classes. The challenge with that is that these discussions tend to be kind of unsystematic. Uh, so it's interesting what J uh, Joe brought in, but we don't know how it systematically relates to something James said. What are the friction points and the overlaps? How do culture and demographics interact with technology to create a new value opportunity for firms, or potentially a threat? So that was always unclear to me. Another issue is information overload. So this may be the average reading list, morning coffee reading list for a marketing instructor, but a lot of our students get easily overwhelmed once you tell them, you have to be really, you know, a very well-informed citizen in order to do external analysis well. You have to read all the time and, you know, we're probably the most information-heavy society we've ever been, but a lot of our students read the least they ever have. So that's one of the uh, challenges. So I'd like to introduce you to a process called scanning today. It comes from the consulting world, has been developed at SRI International in the Silicon Valley a few decades ago. If, uh, talk to economists, they might have done scanning before. And sometimes it's sort of an isolated thing that individuals do, uh, but scanning in the way I'm going to present it to you in the classroom involves groups of people and it involves three steps. Three steps, uh, well, before I get to the steps, I want to point out it's a systematic process, so we are systematically looking at friction points and overlaps rather than looking at things in isolation. It's an open process. You avoid taking a too narrow of a frame around the external environment. If you've done SWOT analysis, students will typically generate opportunities and threats that are closely aligned with the firm's uh, business interests, and that can cause blind spots. So as the 08 crisis has taught us, the most disruptive changes come seemingly out of nowhere, and whoa, how did this happen? It promotes critical thinking and communication skills. So scanning relies on crowdsourcing and pattern recognition. Those are the two critical elements to it. And um, if you've looked at pattern recognition before, you will uh, come to uh, see its uh, relevance in many other fields too, computer science and uh, neural networks and other areas. So the process involves first gathering relevant information, the inputs into the process, and we collect what we call abstracts in step one. In step two, we make sense of the information using pattern recognition. It's a sense-making process. And in step three, we discuss the developments we see in the class 
can we prioritize them in, them in terms of the timeline from actionable to less actionable or more of, a, of, of putting them on a watch list? So to collect abstracts, I send students individually on a mission. And so they don't have to know everything. All they have to do, depending on the size of the class, is collect one or two interesting pieces on, of information from the external environment and write them up in a certain format. Now I tell them, look for new and interesting and cool stuff. This should be dinner conversation material if you had a dinner that night and you had written up an abstract. Uh, look for faint signals of change, discontinuities, disruptive technologies, outliers, unconventional wisdom. This has to be pre-screened to be brand new, interesting, perhaps untested uh, material. Uh, I tell them that they should think about the whole hexagon so that we cover all kinds of uh, developments in the, in the six buckets that typically cover external analysis, not just technology or not just healthcare, for example. This is how, how an abstract looks. They're submitted online. I give them this kind of template with uh, header information, title, source author, URL. The summary should be written in their own words, avoid quoting, and it should be succinct because we have to look at around 70 to 100 of them to make scanning work. And then there are some implications that are general about marketing or, or business. They're not necessarily industry specific. Um, in my learning management system, I uh, use a single forum. Every student submits their abstracts in a single forum, so it's a big long list. You don't have to click on a lot of individual um, links, which is important for the process. And once we have the information, um, again, 100 would be, between 70 and 100 would be the goal. If you have smaller courses, you might have to ask students to submit several abstracts to get to that. If it's less than 70, you don't have uh, enough coverage of different events. Once we have the database in place, it, the attention turns to pattern recognition. And it turns out, the good news is, if you're worried about this, humans are naturally good pattern recognizers. So if, we, some, if you looked into the sky and you've seen dragons and faces before, that's your brain resolving ambiguity in terms of a pattern. If you looked at a crazy abstract painting before and you've seen faces and dogs and cats in there, uh, and paint splatters, that's pattern recognition. Uh, a comprehensive theory of religion relies on human pattern recognition as an explanatory framework. So students read all the abstracts, and so then you go, well, now I'm an instructor and I have to read a hundred things. Well, you do, but they're short things and they're all interesting. Right? They've already been summarized for you, so it's uh, actually a great way to get a lot of information quickly that's very relevant. And then the task is to look for non-obvious patterns. Well, what do I mean by non-obvious patterns? Well, if somebody first starts with pattern recognition and they read 70 to 100 abstracts, it's, there's a natural tendency to lump these stories into obvious categories. The most obvious would be change. Wow, things are changing. <laughs> We can't write about that because everybody knows things are changing. Um, how about uh, healthcare? Is stuff happening in healthcare or marketing? Well, yeah, we know there's stuff happening in healthcare and marketing. So these are kind of the obvious categories. So I tell my students, maybe go through this once, and then your brain will try to put this information into these obvious buckets, then start again, and then get deeper into overlapping categories. So good patterns are those that take, let's say, three stories from different buckets and see how they interact. This one is called Health Enablers at Home, and it had three stories. One was from food uh, marketing, uh, food science, where uh, adopting fruitful strategies, uh, food scientists tried to find a way to get um, to make uh, healthy foods taste like unhealthy foods. So apples taste like hamburgers, so that Americans would eat more fruits and vegetables. Uh, the middle one from Tech was about a tiny nano robot that you would take home and you swallow it and it self-assembles in your stomach and then it goes to a surgical site and does the surgery and you pass it out after you're done. You don't ever have to leave your couch for surgery. And then the last one was that there's a, a health care service issue that um, doctors were increasingly making more house calls, uh, which had all kinds of positive implications for people taking their medication and feeling more connected to the health care system. So as a, as a pattern, we're looking at health enablers at home, right? I provide these kind of handouts to get students to think in terms of patterns. If some of you have done mind mapping before, it's a similar process. You put a central premise or theme in the center of a, of a blank piece of uh, paper, and then you see how different stories or abstracts connect to that. 
this one was called robotic helpers, include driverless cars and nursing robots and um, robots helping out on solar farms and Cornell doing research on robots. So you can see how that sort of pattern works. In terms of the de uh, deliverable, I asked students to uh, think of a catchy title, a short premise, list the abstracts that they use, and then tell me how the abstracts connected. So I have a pattern rubric that I can share with you, and I'm looking for coherence. So if you know, a story doesn't quite connect to the premise, uh, I asked them to revisit it so it connects better, so that you have a, a nice, uh, robust pattern at the end, and then develop some implications. So what's flexible about scanning is that you can essentially have students go home, look at the abstracts, and they all come back into the classroom and then share their patterns. And it becomes a very freewheeling, interesting discussion. I'm just the moderator at this point. I know what the abstracts are, and I, re I can record them all on the board. And then I have the written record of the pattern that I can grade, uh, and they can get a grade for it. And so you can do it as an individual task. Or if students feel nervous about pattern recognition, if they've never done it before, like maybe in an introductory marketing class, you can do it as a group uh, activity inside the class. So students read all the abstracts, they come in, and then they look for patterns together, maybe in groups of three or four, and they develop maybe three or four during a class session, and then they share it out. And so this discussion uh, is actually a very important part of the process because it promotes critical thinking. At this point, we can ask, you know, will consumers accept driverless cars or uh, drone deliveries, right? Amazon is talking about using unmanned drones to deliver packages. What would be the implications of that? Would consumers accept it? And so the marketing student can always wear a critical hat and look at these developments so that we don't become sort of um, overly driven by trends. We apply critical analysis to the trends that we see. Or actually a lot of them are pre-trends because they haven't really been tested yet. They haven't really been measured yet. Um, if you have um, a smaller group of students, maybe 20, you can ask them to use post-it notes to write down the titles of their um, patterns, and then we can post them on the board in terms of this timeline. And I usually draw a timeline where uh, on the left are the actionable patterns that are already happening right now, that firms can do something and go in research mode or action mode, and then the, the watch pattern are sort of more toward the right, and they usually include space travel and you know untested, you know commercial sci-fi kind of opportunities. And so it's another way to give structure to the external environment that wasn't there before. Here's some example patterns from my spring class. This was all introduction marketing. They had never done pattern recognition before, but once you coach them a little bit in avoiding the obvious patterns and giving them some tools, some handouts. They get creative really fast. One was called No Money, No Problem, Developments in Cryptocurrencies, Drone Invasion, Brain-Controlled Robots, Artificial Intelligence in the Cloud, Don't Do, Just Think. And what's interesting, I think you could present these in the Silicon Valley to firms tomorrow and they would be like, oh yeah, we're, you know, this is really interesting, we should talk about this. And it's, you know, it's just some introductory marketing students. So just to wrap this up, I think scanning gives students a workable view of the external environment and empowers them to make sense of developments on a continuous basis. Gives them tools to look for patterns and maybe collaborate with um, coworkers in future jobs. Um, does it work? I've I've done some assessments, and generally people feel you know they feel better able to identify opportunities and threats. Uh, they help them see connections I didn't see before. Some of you probably worry if Humboldt State students are overly good graders. I have some evidence that they are not. They're actually tough graders. You know, some some of my. Um, the average courses are a scale step lower than some of the other um, instructor evaluations we get. So it's not just like a positivity bias at the school. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and I would not recommend doing this for more than 45 students, but uh, I've done it easily with 45. Uh, it can be done online and offline. It's already a hybrid activity. I already asked them to submit the abstracts online. If you're fully online, you ask them to submit the patterns online too in that format. And then they can discuss the patterns in that same forum afterwards to talk about prioritizing and critical thinking. Um, so it's very easily done online. I think the face-to-face -face, uh, session or the discussion session gives it sort of more of that, that real gritty sort of um, sharing feeling, but you can do it online. And I have done it in any marketing course. So it's not just if you have an external analysis chapter. If you teach international marketing, marketing research, 
you can shift the focus of the abstracts to a specific area like data or the world of you know the emerging world of big data. But I wouldn't recommend it because scanning is supposed to be broad. But it can be done in consumer behavior, marketing communications, in any field really, because it's a general purpose tool. My hope, and I'll leave you with this, is to form a student club, which is a scanning club, where students submit these things to a central forum, and then we meet on a monthly basis, not just you know once in the class, but we meet on a monthly basis to discuss emerging developments and think of implications.